All right, we're speaking with Congressman Adrian Smith uh, this morning, and he is uh, here from Washington, D.C. We appreciate you stopping by. It's always great to be home. Yeah, you bet. All right. Um, you guys have uh, had a month in D.C. now since the holidays and so forth. What's, what's your impression of uh, the fact that uh, the Republicans are now in control of both houses of Congress and how things are working? Well, I, I still believe in the... In the in the uh, separation of powers, so it, it's not that Republicans have total control. Uh, certainly, I'm cau cautiously optimistic. Uh, for example, we got the pipeline bill uh, through the House uh, very quickly. It took a little while longer over in the Senate, as it is designed to, to, uh, to be. Uh, but they finally did get that done in the Senate. And now uh, they passed a slightly different version, so that'll come back to the House uh, this week. I'll head to Washington later today. And uh, later this week, we'll take an, another vote on the pipeline. You know, this this uh, legislation is not even necessary for the president to sign uh, the permit, uh, to grant the permit that is necessary. Uh, but certainly, you know, there's volatility in the petroleum industry. Uh, that's uh, shown at the pumps. And I think we want to have good energy policy, and energy policy that uh, where we can buy oil, for example, from our friends, uh, certainly on the same continent, and uh, provide jobs here close to home. What's your thoughts about the president? Uh, obviously, he said he's going to repeal. He's not going to. He's going to veto it. It's coming back to you guys more than likely after the veto. Um, any possibility at all that he might change his mind? Well, he probably doesn't like the fact that Congress is trying to uh, assist him in his decision. <laughs> uh, fact of the matter is, uh, like I said, uh, he can grant the permit without Congress. Uh, but certainly, uh, there. This is about uh, about six years uh, in the process of reviewing and, and safety reviews, environmental reviews, and you know uh, the president's own administration has indicated that uh, environmentally it's a safe project, uh, and certainly it's safer to haul oil uh, through a pipeline than on rail. And we need rail for grain uh, transportation and and other other parts uh, uh, of our economy that that depend heavily on our infrastructure. Okay. So uh, right now it would appear that it's going to be a tough tough vote to get enough votes to override a veto, am I right? That, that is correct. That is correct. Um, where do you get the extra votes if you, in order to do that, do you think? Well, uh, it, it's, uh, it remains to be seen, uh, but uh, this is bipartisan in nature. Uh, this is not just Republicans trying to tell the president what to do. There are many Democrats, uh, including the new Democrat from Omaha, uh, Brad Ashford, who has supported this, uh, he worked on the issue uh, while he was a state senator. He worked on that uh, uh, route. Uh, he worked on the, the process, uh, the legal process, as the chairman of the Judi Judiciary Committee. So this is a very good, balanced approach uh, that, uh, that is being taken. Uh, the environmental community uh, that does not want to see any further development of fossil fuels. Uh, they're kind of using this, I think, as a symbolic a move to try to shut it down. But the uh, fact of the matter is uh, Canada can choose to ship it elsewhere and likely will. Uh, we've got the refining capacity down on the Gulf Coast. Uh, we want to take advantage of that, uh, of that situation and job creation and, and certainly, I think, uh, bring what stability we can uh, to a very volatile industry such as the petroleum industry. Okay. Uh, you obviously are at the, as a member of the House Ways and Means Committee working on tax reform and trade and so forth. Um, is there uh, some kind of a tax reform bill you think coming out of that committee here soon? Well, we already actually passed a, a portion of tax reform last week. We're, we're starting with, with small pieces. Um, certainly, I look forward to what we could maybe call the big deal. Uh, but uh, Section 179 expensing, for example, I hear a lot of, of questions about that uh, from constituents across the 3rd District, especially in agriculture. Uh, we took a vote in the House, again, to make that permanent. And so I'm hoping that the Senate will do that. Uh, I think uh, we, we did that in committee last week, so we'll see that uh, on the floor hopefully in the next few weeks in the full House. Likewise, hopefully in the Senate. Uh, and I think this will be another bipartisan issue, uh, but uh, Section 179 was one of about seven bills uh, we, we advanced out of committee, uh, taking some temporary tax provisions, making them permanent, uh, because the, the temporary nature of, of so much of our tax code, I think, is, is self-defeating. 
Uh, it's it's hard to, for producers and, and you know participants in the economy to depend on uh, these these things when uh, Congress doesn't uh, act. Or ac- actually, it was interesting back before Christmas. Actually, Harry Reid and Republicans had a, a deal all ready to go to to make this permanent, send it on to the president, and the president blew up the negotiation. Uh, he did not like the fact uh, that there weren't uh, some some uh, tax goodies in there for uh, other parts of the economy. But we, we can't expect uh, one piece of legislation to answer all the problems our country faces. I don't think that's what our, our founders had in mind. Uh, we need to take a, as narrow of an issue as possible. Sometimes that's even a little broader than I would I would prefer. But, uh, but we really need to address these issues that face our country. The, the complicated tax code is, is really, I think, holding our economy back. When you look at the cost of compliance, $168 billion every year is spent just calculating one's tax liability, uh, you know, accumulated across the, the uh, uh, country. But, uh, you know, think about that. That's about uh, two years of sequestration. Uh, that that could be money spent elsewhere in our economy that I think would be far more productive. Uh, we're not even getting lobbied by CPAs uh, to to refrain from simplifying our tax code uh, because I think CPAs are trained to do a lot more than just uh, figure out the complexities of one's tax return. And so we've this is a great opportunity, a bipartisan opportunity, to really address a, a problem that our country is facing. Okay. I know uh, uh, when I was listening to, uh, I was out and about on Saturday, I think I was on my way to the expo when uh, one of the guys we have on the radio, Mr. Ludlow, was saying the economy right now is actually doing, in his words, well. He thinks it's like a 5% growth because we had a 2.5% increase in uh, in jobs, I think, and a 3% increase in wages or something like that. I may have those figures maybe but anyway, he says there's a five. To him, there's been a five percent hike in in wages and jobs. When you look at it, a five percent growth in the economy here recently. So he thinks the economy is doing real. You know, is bouncing back right now. Do you see that? Do you see? Well, I think the economy there are, there, bouncing are back? there are some brighter spots. Um, but when you look at the labor participation rate, that's what is so dismal. And you know, there for a while we had 99 weeks uh, of unemployment compensation that uh, was, I think, causing problems in, in the, uh, uh, the labor sector. Uh, when you look at you know, the big picture, we've got a, a long way to go in terms uh, of middle class. Uh, there are other uh, subgroups uh, of unemployment that uh, are, need, need some attention. And, uh, but I think the best thing we can do uh, across the board economically is to reform our tax code, simplify our tax code, uh, and then also work on these trade deals uh, that are pending. They, this shows some uh, great opportunity uh, with developing uh, good relationships with other countries around the world, and we can uh, capitalize on that uh, and hopefully bring some prosperity home by uh, shipping some some uh, products overseas. Which trade deals are we close to getting finalized now? Well, the, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP is what it's called, uh, that's probably the the one that we can uh, pass soonest, but we need a trade promotion authority. Uh, this is a framework that sets up a negotiation uh, with various countries. Uh, there have been some concerns within the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, Japan is one of the countries in that group. Uh, Japan has wanted more exceptions uh, relating to agriculture, actually, than the rest of our trade agreements combined in terms of the number of exceptions. Uh, so I, I would hate uh, for uh, for a situation like that to really slow things down. So uh, we need trade promotion authority so that we can get uh, other countries' best offer. Uh, if if they're left wondering, you know, what our process is going to be, I think it, it's it, it's less likely that they will put their best offer on the table. Uh, so we want their best offer. Uh, let's be good negotiators and, and arrive at uh, better tax policy long term. I'm sorry, better trade policy. Well, tax policy too, but uh, trade policy. Um, you know, I don't think we've been very good negotiators over the years, and so we've kind of accumulated some some bad trade policy. These trade agreements are an opportunity to actually get rid of a lot of the bad parts of our trade policy, move forward, and, and actually uh, be a, a huge benefit for America. Okay, let's talk about because uh, I know you've 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 put out some things regarding co opportunities in the uh, federal health marketplace, and today. Uh, 
as as a, uh, ironically as it was, I had already scheduled this gal from Capwind to come in to talk about uh, the co-opportunities and the benefit deadline and all that on uh, February 15th. She was in on uh, the News Extra program this morning, and uh, she explained it you know, quite well. It would appear that the marketplace, now, now they now have two companies available to them, uh, Coventry and Blue Cross Blue Shield, without co-opportunities being in. Um, unfortunately, I guess we were the one section of the country that had a problem with one of the insurance companies but uh what's your take on co-opportunities and what has happened there and she kind of much explained it today that people still have a couple of good options available to them well <clears throat> two options uh, to choose from for such a major part of our health care uh, i would argue is not enough uh, we we need a an environment where competition is more vibrant than just having two or maybe even three options, even when that that third one did exist. Uh, what we're looking at, though, is a is a a, a big uh, big picture scenario where uh, I think one company uh, underpriced their product, gained a, a large market share, and then the claims followed, and the the funds just weren't there. D- despite the fact that 150 billion dollars, I think it was 145 billion dollars. Um, I'm sorry, $145 million uh, came to one, uh, one co-op for Nebraska and Iowa. And there's a no, another co-op in Tennessee that has uh, uh, suspended enrollment uh, for, I think, some similar uh, concerns. And so uh, looking at the big review, though, uh, of the, this concept, uh, there, I think there needs to be a very close attention paid uh, moving forward. Uh, you know, when I, when I hear from a constituent right here in the Valley uh, what, two years ago when she lost her plan that she was told she could keep, um, she was very concerned because uh, it was a plan that she chose that was uh, affordable for her, uh, that covered her pre-existing condition. She was very satisfied with that. So naturally she was concerned uh, when that plan was canceled due to Obamacare. So uh, she opted for co-opportunities. And then she gets a letter. Uh, some, some people just signed up in December for co-opportunities, and less than a month later, uh, they get a letter uh, saying that that coverage uh, will no longer exist. So I'm hoping that we can work through this. I'm glad there are at least uh, two choices, uh, but we need to foster policies in in Washington uh, that create a a better competitive environment so that consumers have more than just two choices. Okay. Um, I know you guys are uh, uh, taking votes on on repeal and so forth. Is there any... uh package in there in the Congress floating around where um, a bipartisan package that would look at Obamacare and say we're going to keep this part that's working and then we're going to try to fix these other parts that we think are not working very well and and just just at least try to fix it because getting a repeal right now is probably unlikely but could we can we fix it some sure I uh, there are alternatives out there that would cover uh, pre-existing conditions and, and some of the challenges that uh, Americans were facing prior to this this big debate um, but looking at, at which direction we need to go uh, I mean certainly we need bipartisanship it's very unfortunate that uh, the president decided uh, with the supermajority in the Senate and a strong majority in the House uh, back in 2009 and 10 uh, that he he would uh, pursue a a, uh, a bill where the Democrats would go it alone. And uh, I, I think, you know, hindsight would have been to back off that plan, pick up uh, some Republican votes. Uh, it would have been difficult for me uh, to, to get to that point, uh, knowing what the president wanted to do. But... Um, it, it's kind of like you break it, you own it. And so uh, it is seeming to be that uh, Obamacare has broken our, our health insurance system. And, and certainly when I hear from Nebraskans whose premiums have skyrocketed, uh, that, that's by and large uh, the pattern, uh, that uh, premiums have gone up when they were promised they would go down. Uh, plans have been canceled when uh, Nebraskans and Americans in general were promised uh, that they could keep their plan if they liked it. Uh, so uh, here we have co-opportunities that is, that is a creature of Obamacare, and, and here and that hasn't worked out either. There are other components of, of Obamacare, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, a group of 15 individuals appointed by the president to basically set the terms of Medicare. Um, 
even some Democrats who voted for the bill uh, have voiced their concerns about that kind of an approach. Uh, the, uh, the medical device tax is another one that uh, was a major component uh, to supposedly pay for the uh, uh, Obamacare, and yet it has uh, shown uh, to be damaging to the medical device industry here in America. Uh, I'm not sure uh, why anyone would want to add a tax to health care uh, to attempt to pay for health care. That, that just doesn't seem very efficient to me. Uh, but sorting through the issues, uh, you, you take the, uh, the delay of, of the uh, uh, employer mandate that the president did by executive order that I would argue he should not have done. He did not have the power to do that uh, because in statute there was the, uh, uh, the employer mandate. Now, uh, what we did do, though, in the House was uh, pass a bill to codify that in the law. And the president threatened to veto that. Um, that would have been something to bring both sides together and say, hey, let's, let's uh, work on this together moving forward uh, to make sure that we've got a better, uh, a better condition of our overall health insurance uh, uh, scenario because the fact of the matter is uh, there are a lot of, a lot of individuals concerned uh, that there is not that competition, that they don't have the choices uh, that, that they would prefer. Okay. Uh, quickly, let's talk about a few other things. Uh, ISIS is, is still being discussed quite a bit in in Washington. Uh, what's your uh, thoughts about uh, the ISIS threat? In your well, it, it's a huge concern. Uh, I I hope that the president uh, will will be firm. Um, now that uh, Jordan uh, has been drawn in, uh, they've been very aggressive, and I, I commend them for that. Uh, looking at what is at stake moving forward. Uh, we, we better make sure that ISIS knows uh, that, that they cannot thrive. Um, they have found an opportunity, I think, uh, and kind of filled a vacuum. Uh, that's been a problem, and, and we need to make sure we, we keep all of our options on the table. Uh, the president, he gets out there and he, he says what he won't do, and, and I think it would be better uh, for the president to not voice what he won't do. Let's keep all of our options on the table. Uh, I think that's a better negotiating uh, position uh, and, and get our allies around the world who, who are very concerned. And Jordan uh, uh, proving that uh, just in the last few days. Okay. Um, immigration, movement on that at all in, in Congress right now? Uh, not yet this year. Uh, it, it's still pretty early. Uh, but, you know, immigration, is, I believe, is not an issue that uh, is solved with one big bill. I think uh, this immigration concern is solved with finding uh, common interests uh, moving forward. You know, I'm the, the great grandson of German Russian immigrants who settled here in the valley uh, in working the sugar beet fields. They came through Ellis Island. It's a uh, very typical, uh, but I think an inspiring story that is shared by many. Um, it did not take several years hiring a lawyer, spending several thousands of dollars, although it was rigorous at Ellis Island, I'm told that uh, you know they had to prove uh, that uh, that they had that they could provide for themselves uh, uh, into the future and so we need to look at our whole system uh, that I think has been bogged down with bureaucracy it's been bogged down to where uh, you know too many people find it easier to just go around the system and, and uh, immigrate uh, illegally uh, rather than uh, follow the the proper channels so we need to address that uh, there there are other components of, uh, of this issue. Border security is very important. Uh, if we have an unsecure border, it doesn't matter what we do. It, it won't solve the problem. Okay. Uh, the new defense secretary, it appears he's going to be the new defense secretary. It, um, it does appear that what's way. Your, what's, what's, your, what's your thoughts on? Well, it seems part? to me that uh, they're, they're generating support. He's generating support among the committee members. Uh, and, and I, I think that he's got a big task uh, ahead of him, and especially if he's drawn in, in uh, different directions or pulled in different directions. Um, you know, the, the president is, is so anxious to close Gitmo, uh, and yet I don't think all of the ramifications have been fully considered by the president. So I would hope that uh, a new secretary will certainly uh, inform the president of, of what uh, could happen, uh, if, if it doesn't go according to the way the, the president would like it to, to go, 
uh, or you know the best option is perhaps to uh, keep Gitmo uh, open and functioning and in in an effort to keep America safe. Okay. I think we covered a lot of stuff. Thanks so. very much for stopping by. Good to see you. Great to see you. Thank you.